What really happened with your host, Mike Rivero? The history the government hopes you never learn. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome to our show today. It's Friday, January 5th, 2018. Thank goodness it's Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. We have got a lot of stuff to talk about today. The phone lines are open, 800-313-9443. Mike is in our control room, ready to answer the phone when you call on in. And a little program note, the Lady Claire will not be joining us in hour number three again today. But the good news is she is definitely on the mend. She's feeling better. Uh, we're just uh, going to have her rest and really get over this thing before we get her back on the show. So uh, I, I want to thank everybody who sent in emails uh, and, and notes of, of get well wishes, recommendations, <clears throat> folk cures that would uh, uh, help us both get over this thing. I'm still dealing with the very, very tail end of it. And, in fact, today in the mail we, we got uh, something rather interesting from Alaska called chaga, which is this parasitic fungus that grows on trees, and it has to be harvested in the winter uh, way out in the woods by Fairbanks. And I did a little web search on it, and apparently this is a, a very well-known uh, natural material uh, that uh, with a lot of health benefits. So uh, thanks to uh, who sent that in. Uh, so let's get into the story here, uh, the, rather the news here. Uh, the publisher of Fire and Fury in defying Trump's attempts uh, to block the release of the book put it on sale last night at midnight. Bookstores are reporting uh, that it's already sold out. It's number one up at the Amazon uh, website uh, on all the orders they're getting. So whatever the reason was behind this thing, Mike Wolf has been made very, very wealthy uh, by all of this. And uh, for all we know, the controversy may have just been that, that was it about. Kick up a controversy about the book, and Mike Wolf and his publisher make a lot of money. Now, we're hearing that at one point, Steve Bannon uh, did plan on refuting the quotes uh, that are in the book. And uh, basically everybody in the White House uh, is saying they never said any of these things. Uh, and apparently Bannon had a statement prepared that was going to call Trump Jr. a patriot and say that, no, he doesn't believe he committed treason. This was being reported over at the Hill. And at this point, a lot of people are starting to say, is this for real? Remember yesterday I, I said, when I saw those first excerpts, I said, it just didn't feel right. My gut was telling me that, that this wasn't for real. And apparently a lot of other people are getting that same uh, 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 sense. Uh, so this may have been a huge joke that Mike Wolf uh, is playing on us all, and he's laughing all the way to the bank here. But apparently Mike Wolf has a long reputation of being less than accurate uh, in his books and reporting. In his first bestseller, Burn Rate, How I Survived the Gold Rush Years on the Internet, Wolf was accused of misquoting a dozen people for his sensationalized tale about how he tried to do an Internet startup and failed. And one of the people uh, quoted in the book, uh, Isabel Maxwell, called her quotes and representations by Wolf gratuitous and inaccurate. And in response, Wolf claimed that the quotes came from notes that he took when he sat in on meetings. But people who were at those meetings said that he never took notes. He, 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 if he wasn't Linda Tripping it, he was Stephen Glassing it. This is from the San Francisco Gate in 1998. And Wolf was also deemed a liar by book editor Judith Regan and New Republic columnist Andrew Sullivan while he was writing for New York Magazine. <clears throat> now, after writing a profile about Regan for the magazine, she disputed nearly every paragraph contained within it. She later accused him of being obsessed with her while she threatened to take him to court over what he wrote. And uh, Reagan was quoted in the New York Daily News in 2008 saying, Michael Wolf has been obsessed with me and my sex life for close to 30 years. I'm finally going to give him what he wants. He's going to get blank by Judith Regan. 
Uh, Regan apparently had the same problems over at HarperCollins. Uh, rather, I'm sorry, Regan was fired by HarperCollins over her plan to publish O.J. Simpson's book, If I Did It. And apparently, Wolf sent her a vaguely threatening email urging her to speak to him for his book uh, on Rupert Murdoch. So there's been an interaction there. And then going on, I mean, a huge fight between Regan and uh, Wolf there. Uh, apparently, Wolf also claimed that Regan had gone on a date with former Fox News CEO Roger Ailes, and both, uh, everybody says it was one dinner, it was a business dinner to discuss you know, some possible enterprises. Now, the Washington Post described Wolf as a provocateur and media polemicist. Wolf has a penchant for stirring up an argument and pushing the facts as far as they'll go, and sometimes further than they can tolerate, according to his critics. He has been accused of not just recreating scenes in his books and columns, but of creating them wholesale. Now, looking back over all of the scandals of uh, journalists who've been caught fabricating news, it seems like Wolf is just one more of the usual prostitute uh, and correspondent uh, that we're going to see there. Uh, apparently, in New Republic in 2004, Michelle Kotel wrote that Wolf, quote, has a reputation for bursting embargoes and burning sources by putting off-the-record comments on the record. So... Again, uh, the book is, uh, people are buying the book, but it doesn't stand the smell test. It really doesn't. We're going to do a shout out now to our on-air affiliates who are just now rejoining the network. Now, Donald Trump issued a tweet uh, which is refuting claims by Michael Wolff that he was given high-level access to the White House in order to interview people to write the book, and Trump has now tweeted out saying that Wolf had zero access to the White House, said that uh, Trump turned him down repeatedly uh, when, uh, when requested. And he's saying he never spoke to him for the book. It's full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. And he names them uh, in terms of the uh, Bannon quotes, which apparently Bannon considered going public refuting, uh, calls him Sloppy Steve now. This thing is really heating up. It's very undignified. And people are trying to, trying to figure out what's going on. I think this is part, I think this book is propaganda for the Democrats' efforts to get Donald Trump out of the White House under the 25th Amendment. It dovetails with that agenda perfectly. Story coming out of Sputnik News, uh, basically speculating uh, that Bannon now wants the president to fail. And that is both out of the animosity uh, from Bannon's firing uh, and also uh, for the fact that Bannon's chief criticism about, about Donald Trump is we did not get the Donald Trump we voted for, which unfortunately I do agree with. We didn't get the Donald Trump who was going to pull back on military interventions. We so far have not gotten the Donald Trump uh, that is going to put Hillary Clinton in prison. And those, those were two of the biggies as far as I was concerned. Now, Steve Bannon appears to be in trouble. He may soon be leaving Breitbart News. And <clears throat> there was speculation what was going to happen between Bannon and the Mercer family, because the Mercer family uh, were his primary bankroll uh, for doing what he was doing. Uh, but Rebecca Mercer has now gone public, basically backing Donald Trump and saying that her family uh, has not communicated with Bannon in many months. They have stopped providing financial support for his political agenda, and they certainly do not support his recent actions and statements. So it looks like Bannon has lost his primary wallet. Now here is, I have, I have a little problem, I have, I have a few problems with Donald Trump, but one of them is he's trying to take credit for things other people are doing or things that just sort of happen by themselves. Donald Trump tried to take credit, for example, for getting rid of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria when that was clearly done by the Syrian government aided by Russia. And today, apparently, he came on out 
taking credit uh, for the safest year on record in commercial aviation. And there were no deaths on commercial aviation last year. And in a tweet, he comes on out and says, since taking office, I've been very strict on commercial aviation, and good news, it was just reported, zero deaths. Trump has got to stop trying to take credit for everything good that happens. Uh, he's grandstanding. I'm almost ready for him to tweet on out that today he made the sun rise. And if he continues behaving like this, uh, he's only helping to build a case for the 25th Amendment. Trump needs to get some really good advisors, and he's got to listen to them. And instead, he surrounded himself by alligators from the swamp that he was going to drain. Another disappointment. And he's coming across as, as far less than presidential. He's really hurting himself with this sort of thing. Now, as you know, the Department of Justice has announced a new probe in Hillary's email server scandal. With Sessions in charge of the Justice Department, I'm not expecting anything significant. They're already talking about the Comey excuse. Yes, these things happened, but they didn't mean to do wrong, therefore off the hook. The Justice Department has announced today uh, that there will be in a, a probe into the Clinton Foundation. Uh, and, but unfortunately, there was a previous investigation by the government that claimed not to find anything irregular. And again, it is stunning the degree of protection of Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton by the almost the entire establishment inside the Beltway. Now, FBI Director Christopher Wray is out there saying the Bureau is investigating Antifa members uh, who are acting like anarchist extremists and motivated to create violence. And they're trying to be very clear, saying that they're not investigating the Antifa ideology, just the actions of individuals. And that seems a reasonable thing to be doing. We don't want the government investigating anybody's ideology. Now, a story coming out of shtfplan.com gets back to that issue that the Democrats uh, are, are looking to get rid of Trump, either through impeachment or the 25th Amendment. And in this particular case, uh, again, apparently one Republican senator and a dozen or so Democrats had a meeting uh, with a noted psychiatrist, uh, in fact, the psychiatry professor at Yale University, Dr. Bandy X. Lee. Uh, and Lee is out there going along with the program saying Trump is going to unravel. Uh, the rush of tweeting is an indication of his falling apart under stress. Uh, Trump is going to get worse and will become uncontainable with the pressures of the presidency. So they're trying to build a case that Donald Trump uh, is incompetent coming apart, and it does dovetail with the image of Trump uh, that is being put forward in this book, Fire and Fury, at least the excerpts that have already been published. I don't have a copy just yet. So I think the game is really on. The establishment politicians want Trump gone because they're scared. All their cover-ups are starting to unravel. And the public is becoming aware. There's a lot of just shameful shenanigans going on inside that deep state. Gun running, drug running, possible pedophilia. That keeps coming up over and over again. And, of course, the Uranium One deal, the Clinton Foundation, the email server, a massive election fraud. And I have to tell you, I'm very disappointed that Trump uh, dissolved his commission on election integrity and said, we'll have the Department of Homeland Security look at it. It looks like he's caved on that. And I can understand probably a lot of pressure was put on him uh, because if the American people, if the majority of the American people start thinking the election system is crooked, then it all starts to unravel. Americans are not going to obey or pay the bills of a government they themselves did not elect. 
So they want us to go back to believing the elections are fair and honest. Oh, how could you even think our elections are crooked? Well, you might ask Bernie Sanders about that one. Now, do you remember back when former FBI Director James Comey had his press conference about uh, the FBI's investigation <clears throat> into Hillary's handling of classified documents, and he had this memo that, that he basically went down and that, that was read into the record uh, about all the things that had gone on. It turns out that Comey's original Clinton memo uh, has now been revealed. Uh, basically because it was one of the documents subpoenaed by the Senate Homeland and Government Affairs uh, Committee. And it turns out the original memo was much more striking in terms of its description of criminal activity, vast amounts of classified information going to that unsecured server, uh, and in many cases they, they said gross negligence. Uh, and this memo was edited and deleted, to water it down, uh, to basically turn what should have been a felony charge down to basically a wrist slap. And the reason they took out grossly negligent, replaced it with extreme carelessness, was to get around the language in Title 18, which says gross negligence in re revealing classified information is a felony violation of Title 18. And they thought by changing it to extreme carelessness, they could evade that. Well, I don't know about you, but to me, grossly negligent and extreme carelessness seems to be describing exactly the same thing. And if my theory about what Hillary Clinton was doing with that server is correct, then we're not dealing with negligence or carelessness or weasel wording. Uh, everything she did was deliberate. That server was her idea to set that up. And that's a question that needs to be asked. And maybe that's the question that everybody inside Washington, D.C. is terrified of. And that's why they're trying to make this all go away. Okay. Uh, getting on back to the Mercer family, uh, another indication that they may be bailing on Steve Bannon uh, is apparently they're talking with Peter Thiel about launching a new conservative news outlet uh, which would host some former Fox commentators who were let go from that channel. And I think there ought to be more news outlets. We need to bring back a multiplicity of media outlets so that differing points of view can be put out there for you, the American people, to evaluate. It wasn't all that long ago there were actually laws to guarantee diversity of media opinion. No one company or individual was allowed to own too much media in any given market. I mean, we can go back and look at William Randolph Hearst, and the Hearst newspapers were all over the country, but they were restricted in terms of how much uh, of each market, each city, uh, they could sell to to give other newspapers a voice. We need to get back to that. Now, Judicial Watch has issued a statement uh, basically correcting something that's been in the corporate media for the last few days because they've been talking about uh, Anthony Weiner's laptop. They've been talking about how five classified emails were found on it and trying to make it sound like Five, it's not that big a deal. It's only five, it's only five. Judicial Watch has come on out and, and said that there are at least 18 classified emails they're aware of, and there may well be more because they're still going through uh, that very awkward system at the State Department's website uh, that is set up to index and present these documents. Uh, and in true government fashion, it's very difficult to get from the end. You can't just scan. You have to go and do a lot of work just to see a single page. And they're still working through that. We've got to take a break for commercials. We will be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show. And for those of you who want to support Republic Broadcasting, again, the address to send a check or money order is Republic Broadcasting Network. 2251 Double Creek Drive, number 302, and that's in Round Rock, Texas, 
78664. If you want to call on in and become a uh, subscriber to Republic Broadcasting, the phone number is 800-724-2719, extension 03. Now, somebody who actually has a, a copy uh, of, of the new book, Fire and Fury, I guess it was an e-book, uh, has sent in something we all need to pay attention to. Okay, this is a direct quote from the preface to the book. Many of the accounts of what has happened in the Trump White House are in conflict with one another. Many in Trumpian fashion are baldly untrue. These conflicts and that looseness with the truth, if not with reality itself, are an elemental thread of the book. In other words, it's unverified trash. Just keep that in mind. All right, so we're talking about Attorney General Jeff Sessions. People want him to, to resign. People want Trump to fire him. Uh, the only thing he seems to be doing is declaring war on medical marijuana. More about that later in the show. And it almost seems we could all have avoided so much problems if he had just stayed a senator down in, in Alabama. And speaking of which, under Alabama law, uh, election records are supposed to be held uh, for 22 months. Actually, it's a federal law. And the state of Alabama has already destroyed all the records from their last election. And that should be a red flag that, yes, it, in point of fact, it was a crooked election. I mean, I remember that uh, video uh, of somebody being interviewed and just spilling the beans that people were coming from out of state to vote for Jones. That's election fraud. You're not allowed to vote in another state's state elections. I can't go to Nevada and vote for their senators and representatives because I'm a citizen of Hawaii. It's just so blatant and open. Do they really believe the American people aren't seeing this? It's amazing. All right, let's get into the war zones here. Uh, more good news from Syria, uh, if you are supportive of the Syrian people retaining their own country. Uh, apparently, the uh, Syrian Arab Army, Tiger Forces, backed up by Russian Aerospace Forces, captured the villages of Sim El Abid, El Fail, Rubaida, Meshafe, El Qasr, El Abyad, Rabi Musa, Hagia, and, and another long list in, in southeastern Idlib. <clears throat> they're, they're, they're moving very, very rapidly. According to pro-government sources, seven militants were killed and a vehicle was destroyed during the advance. On the same day, the Sham Legion reportedly destroyed uh, a Syrian Arab Army battle tank with an anti-tank guided missile near the town of Atshan. Now government troops are getting ready to advance on the town of Sinjar. Now apparently, uh, some of the uh, Syrian rebels... And they're still getting some sophisticated weapons, such as the weapon that took out the main battle tank. Apparently, they were able uh, to use artillery to destroy several Russian planes. And, uh, again, they got to close off the borders and stop that stuff from coming on in. I wonder who's bringing in those weapons to Syria. I, I just, I wonder. It's on the tip of my tongue, I'm sure. <clears throat> We know who's doing it. There have been actual videos of uh, U.S. aircraft airdropping supplies to these rebels. Over in Iran, uh, it looks like the uh, protests, uh, at least the violent ones, uh, are pretty much winding down. And Iran's attorney general uh, is saying that their intelligence is indicating uh, that this was a covert U.S.-Israeli-Saudi uh, operation uh, to destabilize the country and possibly bring down uh, the government. However, there are still voices out there saying that regime change wasn't really the agenda so much as kicking up the protests, forcing the government of Iran to respond, 
uh, and then using that response to persuade the European Union to put more sanctions back onto Iran to try and starve them into submission. So we'll see what happens on there. So far, we're not exactly seeing a rush of European nations uh, to hop on the sanctions bandwagon. In fact, the sense I get uh, just looking at global geopolitics is, is everybody's getting sick of these sanctions wars. And they're beginning to realize that the weaponization of sanctions uh, is a very good reason not to go any further with a globalist economy. Because once you are tangled up in that globalist economy, you become vulnerable to sanctions attacks. Just something to think about. We're going to take another break for commercials, and we'll be right back. Join us on the air, 800-313-9443. Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show. We're going to go to the telephones now. Francis in North Carolina. Aloha, Francis. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hello, aloha to you both. Aloha, um, snack bar. You know, whatever. It, there you go, snack bar too. Back at you. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, whenever I hear that bump music talking about he wants to be a pirate and sail the seven seas and so forth, the Nazim and so forth, it reminds me, of course, this is not originally what I called about, but every time I hear that song, I think about the intro to any film you happen to put uh, in, uh, in your player or whatever to watch. They always have this uh, anti piracy. Warning from the FBI or whatever have you, it's Nazim uh, Alphabet Soup Group, uh, warning against such piracy. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, that's pretty good coming from, that's like the pot calling the kettle black. Yes. I mean, with all the stuff that they can, because they get into, and yet they're going to post that on a, on a, on the intro of a film that you watch at home, it's a joke. It is a, a joke. joke. It's a complete waste of bandwidth because the people who are going to pirate the content aren't paying attention to it. And everybody else who's reading it, uh, it doesn't apply to them. It's really, it's really, it's really bizarre. But anyway, no. What it so is, it, 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 it's something the government does to make it look like the government is doing something about the problem. Uh, but uh, industry Thanks. analysts are saying uh, content piracy really isn't the big problem. Uh, they like to blame it for the declining revenues of the entertainment industry, uh, but. The real issue is the declining economy. People don't have as much money to go to movies or buy uh, Blu-ray discs. For and the other part of it, of course, is that Hollywood, as it becomes more politically correct, is just cranking out junk people don't want to see. Uh, and yeah. uh, it, it really, it, I mean, it's like repeats and sequels, and there's very little originality coming on out. You have a whole new meaning to the words scapegoat. But anyway, uh, originally what I was calling about was is uh, uh, wishing Claire a much speedy recovery from uh, the buggy roo that she got or whatever the case was. So uh, if people want to call out a prayer, spell, meditation, whatever have you, then fine. Call me that. I don't care. No, no. But I, I thank you very much. Uh, you know, we appreciate the sentiment. And again, as I said at the top of the show, uh, Claire is doing much better. She's not over it, but she is doing a lot better. Uh, and uh, I'm greatly relieved because th there were a couple of days there I was very, very worried about her. I can I can appreciate that uh, in same sentiments. Uh, quick question for you. Um, this may have been inquired about before. I do not recall, so you have to overlook my uh, my uh, gap of memory for that matter. But are you familiar with someone by the name of Deborah? Tavares. Doesn't really ring a bell. Does not? Okay. Because apparently she does a site online called StopTheCrime.net or whatever the case was. Okay. And uh, apparently she covers a lot of things that have to do with uh, how the environment is dealt with or been done to, let alone uh, what, who the culprits may be and why and whatever for reasons and so forth, you know, go on and on and on. And uh, apparently she's been out of sync for about a, a year or so, uh, I guess maybe trying to watch her back or whatever in the, in the process because a lot of things that she's been reporting and so forth. So um, it's really gotten interesting. So I just thought I would touch friends with you and see what you thought of her or whatever. So. Well, I'll have to I'll, I'll have to check it out, uh, and, and you know, there's the the one bad thing about the growth of the internet and the independent media 
uh, is there's such a huge right. volume of information, no one individual can uh, look at it all. And I, I try and look at as much as I can, but obviously I, I can't get to everything. But I do welcome suggestions, and I do go and look at these things. I would have to agree because even though some may be legit, some can be absolute trash. Yeah, there's a lot of junk out there. There's a, oh, a lot of uh, junk there. And, uh, oh, I'm getting from uh, Mike in the uh, control room uh, that apparently uh, she's had a lot of guest appearances on RBN. So we'll try and uh, get her oh, on this show. Uh-oh, watch out now. Okay. Y'all have fun. Later. All right, we will. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get back to phone calls, and there's a lot of callers waiting on the line right now, Citizen Free Press uh, just posted a story uh, on how their, that first probe into the Clinton Foundation, I mentioned that uh, Justice Department is doing a, a new probe, and there had been one before. Uh, the story is, is breaking, sourced at the Free Beacon, uh, basically is saying that the Obama Justice Department, Loretta Lynch, stopped the probe during the election. And uh, apparently... Uh, uh, no interviews with witnesses were allowed, uh, and no subpoenas were allowed by Loretta Lynch. So here we have, again, the entire machinery of the federal government, including the White House itself, trying to protect Hillary and her dark secrets in order to protect themselves. The more we read things like this, the more convinced I am that my theory about what Hillary was doing with that email server is the correct one. And it's a scandal big enough to shatter the federal government, to, dis to completely discredit it and delegitimize it. All right, let's get back to the phones here. We're going to go to Joe in Tennessee. Aloha, Joe. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. Uh, I like your pirate song also. Uh, I did 35 years in the Merchant Marine, so I'm a bit of a pirate myself. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I saw Geraldo on TV last night, and he's talking about the Hillary investigation being old news. And I think politically that's going to be what they're going to say. Yes. And I'll tell you the truth. I don't really want Hillary's scalp as much as I want the enablers in the FBI and the Justice Department who violated their oaths. In, in not investigating her. Those are the people I really want to see go to prison because they are the people that really let this country down. Hillary Clinton, of course, she's a criminal and a psychopath. But these other people, they were our checks and balances. They were people that raised their hands and swore an oath to be investigators and to, to try to protect the American people from psychopaths like Hillary Clinton. Uh, personally, I wouldn't care if Trump pardoned her, but I want to see all the enablers out, thrown out, put in prison, take their pensions, and get them out of this, the U.S. government once and for all. Well, what I want to see is the American people made fully aware of just why all of these uh, career uh, officials at FBI and Department of Justice were circling the wagons around Hillary, because it's not Hillary they're protecting. Uh, it's basically That's exactly right. the inner workings of uh, the deep state uh, going all the way back to Arkansas in the 1980s uh, and that CIA gun and drug running operation out of Arkansas under then Governor Bill Clinton. The American people need to know what their government is really doing. Uh, and uh, that's Mike, what I want to see happen. Do you think they're going to go into Waco? Do you think they'll go into 9-11? I don't, uh, you, like you say, they're going to circle the wagons. But at the same time, we need the people need the truth. I think they're going to actually throw Hillary to the wolves before they, they expose the deep state because that's what I see happening here. But at the same time, I really want to see an investigation of the investigators is what I want to see and the deep state uh, exposed. One other quick thing. This whole writer, this guy Wolf, Yes. I mean, it seems ridiculous that they even let that guy in the White House. This is a setup. Trump, Trump's playing with this, this whole thing. I think Trump's doing it on purpose. I don't know why, but, I mean, to let a sneaky guy like that, I mean, even his name, Wolf, in there, it just seems like this is all just Trump doing his typical setting traps and well, then playing around. Well, now, hang I, on. Trump, be that stupid. Trump has come on out saying that, in point of fact, Michael Wolf did not have any access to the White House. Uh, that is a uh, that's a, a fiction that Wolf came up with. 
Uh, and Trump is saying that uh, Wolf applied for access to the White House several times and was turned down flat each and every time. I mean, people are already pointing out uh, some very obvious factual errors in the book. Uh, at one point, Wolf says Trump didn't know uh, who John Boehner was, uh, uh, but yet there's a, a photo of them playing golf together from way before the time that Wolf uh, says Trump made that comment. Uh, so, uh, and again, uh, it's right there in the preface to the book. He's admitting uh, it's, it's junk. It's absolute sensationalist yeah. tabloid junk. Uh, and, uh, but uh, again, I think it's propaganda uh, to support the move to get Trump out of the White House under the 25th Amendment. Because how many of you actually read the preface to a book that you've bought? People tend to skip over the preface and the foreword and just get right into the, the meat of the book. Now, going but, on I mean, back, just... let, let, let me, let me go, go on back here to this idea of will they investigate Waco, will they investigate uh, 9-11. Uh, the, the, what I see is possibly happening is if Hillary really feels uh, that she's going down, uh, she's got the dirt, and she could just start blabbing to everybody and just open up that can of worms. Okay, yes, the institutional government is trying to protect this all, but all it's going to take is one person who's looking at a lifetime in prison and figures they've got nothing left to lose to just start saying, well, you think what I did was bad. Those people over there, they did this. And then the accusations will start flying back and forth like crazy. Boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? Oh, hey, one other thing is, get the beer and pretzels. You know, but, but Trump seems like he's smart, but I watch these press conferences, and they just pick these these reporters to ask him questions, and they're all from the fake news, NBC, ABC. When's he going to start picking on guys from the alternate media? I mean, he's got the power to, to basically ignore the people that ask him rude questions and insult them. I don't understand it. It just frustrates me that he doesn't, like, put more of his own people there to ask questions and start developing a better press corps of people like us, you know? Well, I think what's going on is that uh, the White House press secretary decides who does and does not get uh, a press pass or press credentials for the White House. I mean, <clears throat> I, I would think at least uh, somebody from Alex Jones' uh, operation would be allowed in there, given how strongly Alex Jones supported Trump. I mean, Trump went on Alex, Alex Jones' show as a guest. Uh, but uh, again, Trump has just been completely corralled. And it isn't Trump who's doing this. It is that deep state that is desperate to protect their secrets and resell the illusions. Uh, and they're fighting a losing battle. They're definitely losing ground. Well, we, I can only hope. I just can't believe I keep seeing or ask the same people who just say insulting things about the president, and I'm, I can't just believe how dumb they're doing. Unless they're, they're doing that on purpose also. It just seems kind of uh, ridiculous. But anyway, thanks, and have a good weekend, Mike, and I hope your wife feels better. She, she is feeling better. She's not over it, but she is feeling better. She's much better than she was a few days ago, and I, I'm absolutely delighted about that. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for the phone call, and we're going to switch over to Mo in Florida. Aloha, Mo. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hello, Michael. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I've been out of town, so I've kind of missed your show. I tried to catch up on a few of them, so if I'm repeating something that, or asking a question you've already answered. But uh, my, I was actually going to call in on 5G and the dangers of this, uh, uh, this, this microwave penetration that is – and really a lot of people are worried about. But I am so upset about this little Jeff Sessions deal with this medical marijuana that I, I just, I want to, you know, I, I just, I would do anything to get this guy out of there. And I, I don't know why this guy would would do this knowing what the sentiment is nationally. What does he have to gain? Is there something I'm missing or do they have a control file on, on him? Well, I think what's going on is we know that the alcohol uh, industry and the tobacco industry have been lobbying very, very hard to keep marijuana illegal uh, because if you cannot grow a marijuana plant in your backyard, uh, then you have to go down to a store and spend money uh, for the alternative intoxicants. And I think that is what the whole argument is all about. Uh, is uh, commoditizing intoxicants, not allowing you to uh, grow or make your own. Uh, and uh, it's been happening on several fronts. When I was a little kid, 
uh, it was still legal to operate your own still and make your own whiskey. Uh, you were not allowed to sell it or give it away or trade it without a tax stamp, but you could have a personal use still, and my grandfather had one. Uh, but today, of course, the mere possession of a still will get you thrown in prison for a very long time. Oh, that's true. You know, Ron Paul came on his Liberty Report and he never said this before because he doesn't get into this type of uh, direction, but he, he called for Jeff Sessions to resign immediately, you know, just strictly out of freedom. You know, and whatever Ron Paul says is 99% where, where it's at, you know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I really wanted him to win when he ran. I campaigned for him twice, and it was very disheartening for me. But the man is the man is freedom, like you are. You know, he's he's just a freedom lover. You know, and okay, Michael, if you have anything to say about 5G and the dangers, I was kind of worried about. I kind of uh, wanted your opinion, but we're probably running out of time, so uh, I'll hang up and take your you know answer on the air if you have time. Thank you. All right. Well, basically, uh, all radio waves uh, are going to impact your body at the very least because uh, any of that energy that you absorb is converted to heat. Uh, there is a concern that certain frequencies of microwaves will result in a recently discovered phenomenon. I think, if I recall correctly, this was uh, worked out at John Hopkins, uh, called microwave resonance, where even though the energy level of the uh, radio wave is not sufficient to break a molecular bond, it can start a molecule vibrating and resonating to the point where it can suffer molecular damage. Uh, and so obviously there's an area of concern. The towers themselves are not the problem. The problem, <clears throat> excuse me just a second. The problem is, <clears throat> one more minute. Okay, the problem is the handheld device. <clears throat> because if you're far away from the tower, uh, your cell phone <clears throat> automatically Excuse me just a second. I've got to get a sip of water here. All right. <clears throat> All right. Like I said, I'm still in the tail end of this bug. Uh, the problem is when you're far away from that tower, your phone handset automatically increases its power as a transmitter to reach that tower. And, of course, you've got that uh, phone right up against your head. And I think there's an area of concern and there ought to be some research done. It won't be, though, uh, because under our current fascist economic system, nobody is funding research to show how any of our products are causing harm, whether it's cell phone radiation or vaccines or GMO or whatever. It's simply not being done. Uh, and uh, there have been a lot of uh, suspicions through the years that exposure to petroleum products uh, is one of the causes of cancer. Nobody is uh, uh, really looking into that anymore. A few years ago, I was trying to do some research, uh, and I went out to find uh, some cancer maps, just a map of uh, cities and states showing uh, the uh, per capita incidence of cancer, I couldn't find any. It's like a big secret. Uh, they don't want you to know where the areas are that uh, have the most cancer cases because uh, you might decide you don't want to live there, and they have vested financial interests in having you live in these areas. So uh, obviously there's a concern, uh, and it's a good reason uh, to have your cell phone actually on your belt and use a Bluetooth headset because then you're, you're that much farther away from the cell phone transmitter. And under the inverse square law, even a little distance is going to be a significant drop uh, in the exposure to the radiation. And, of course, in a lot of states, uh, oh, we're, we're in a commercial break here. Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show here. We're finishing up with uh, Mo in Florida. And the last comment I had, in, a, in addition to having your cell phone on your belt and using a Bluetooth headset, uh, you're, you're going to have less exposure to the transmitter energy. And, of course, in a lot of states, uh, you can get a ticket for talking on your cell phone while driving. That's the case here in uh, Hawaii, uh, unless you're using a headset. So, there it is. Anyway, Mo, thank you very much for the phone call. Let's move over to Kevin in West Virginia. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? 
Hey, Mr. Mike, the last couple of callers have, have uh, provoked me to say what I wanted to say. Um, I did call about, I wanted to talk about Bannon, uh, but I actually know the real reason why the Oklahoma City is bombed, the building, the federal building. Um, I don't know how much investigation you've done into that, but the real reason why the Oklahoma City bombing was bombed is because before we went to uh, Iraq the very first time, we had, had given Saddam anthrax. Before we sent our troops over, we gave them an experimental dose of anthrax, of the anthrax vaccine, and everybody got sick. Over 100,000 people got sick, as well as family members. All the medical records were in that building. That's why the Oklahoma City building was bombed. Well, that's one. I'd heard that story before, and that's certainly one uh, mess that was uh, uh, destroyed by the bombing. But there was another. Uh, outrage over what happened at Waco had forced Congress to call for hearings. And somehow or other, all of the uh, BATF and FBI records regarding the assault on that church were also being stored in the Oklahoma Federal Building uh, when it was destroyed. So they, they used that to, to not only clean up a couple of really ugly messes, uh, but of course to push the domestic terror agenda. I mean, you see where this is headed, though. I mean, absolutely. We're just going to be bigger and better and more spectacular things than 9-11 down the road. I hope not, but I kind of have a feeling pretty soon you're, you're, our next attacks are going to be done by drones, and you're not going to see any more public speaking. Everything is going to be done inside or maybe even uh, holographic holograms, maybe. Just thought. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a little out there with that one. Yes. I'm kind of curious to hear you about that. Okay, well, I, I agree with you that we have to be on guard against false flags uh, and deceptions. And I, Americans have really awakened to that uh, because when there was that fire up at the Clintons' uh, place in, in Massachusetts, in Chappaqua, uh, it was all over the Internet. People were joking about they were destroying evidence. Uh, uh, Juanita Broderick made a joke that Hillary was trying to burn Juanita's new tell-all book. Uh, and that tells you that people, that's now their first assumption. Of course, as I reported yesterday, it was actually the Secret Service building on the property uh, that caught fire and it wasn't all that, uh, that big. Uh, I, I, I dislike the way people throw around the word hologram or holograph. Uh, most people are seeing things in movies and they think that's the way holograms really work, and it isn't. But uh, again, the government could come up with some new deception to try and get us to forget all about the corruption. But I think it may be past that point where uh, Americans are going to see a new 9-11 and just presume it's another government fake. Anyway, we're going to let you go because we're coming up on our station identification. And when we come back, we've got a breaking story that we're going to share with you. So uh, stay tuned. And we'll be back with hour number two of our program. Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show here. And this story just showed up uh, on my desk here. Uh, apparently, uh, Senators Grassley and Graham uh, have sent a referral to the Justice Department requesting an investigation of Christopher Steele, the author of that discredited Russian dossier on Donald Trump, and specifically referring to Title 18, Section 1001, which is the part of Title 18 that does make it a crime uh, to lie or deceive federal authorities. And they're saying they sent the referral over there to the Senate, uh, to, rather to the Department of Justice, uh, based on inconsistencies and contradictions in what Christopher Steele was saying uh, to their various hearings. Now, this is not an investigation into the veracity of the contents of the dossier, which have already been discredited, uh, but this could be uh, the opening shot because remember what I was saying to that other caller, how this will all break apart is one person uh, who is, is feeling the heat and feeling the pressure will make a deal and start naming names. And Steele could basically blow the whistle on how this was an intentional hoax and a bit of, of, of campaign propaganda from Fusion GPS tracking back to the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee. All it's going to take is for one of these highly placed people to hit the panic button, and then the accusations are going to be flying in all directions, and that will be a fun show to watch indeed. <clears throat> now, getting back to the international news, 
Uh, North Korea has accepted South Korea's offer to meet in person for talks. This is starting to look very, very promising, and they're going to hold the, the talks uh, tomorrow. Today is Kim Jong-un's birthday, and I'm glad that so far he has not shot off a missile or a nuclear weapon because he loves to do these things on North Korean holidays, of which his birthday is one. Now, there's an interesting article that we posted from over in Politico uh, saying that there does have to be a new approach to North Korea. And they, too, are seeing uh, a positive sign in the fact that North and South Korea are preparing to have talks. Uh, and it's looking very promising uh, that uh, North Korea will be able to attend the Olympics in South Korea. That's going to be a, a good sign. We know that the U.S. has backed off and promised there will be no more of this saber-rattling drills uh, until after the Olympics are over. So this is all looking very, very positive. And Politico's story uh, is basically saying that it's important not to make the same mistakes that doomed pa past negotiations. Uh, and they're referring to what were called the six-party talks, which collapsed in 2009. And North Korea came out of those talks convinced that the main reason the, uh, that uh, the other parties wanted North Korea to disarm uh, was to carry out regime change, that the international community's ultimate goal was regime change. Actually, it's more of the U.S. Uh, goal. And this fear continues to the present day, and it's created the current deadlock. And unfortunately, Trump's rhetoric uh, has done nothing to ease North Korea's concerns, which are based on a major part with past U.S. history with other countries. Libya stopped its very fledgling nuclear program on the promise they'd be left alone. And then they got invaded. Iraq gave up their chemical weapons on the promise they'd be left alone. Then they got invaded. Syria gave up their chemical weapons on the promise they'd be left alone, and the U.S. is still inside Syria trying to figure out some way to get aside. So looking at that track record, that really is the problem. Because North Korea is not going to give up their weapons of deterrence, which is what these long-range missiles and nuclear warheads are. They're weapons of deterrence unless they know for a fact the U.S. will not be coming after them. And there's no, way the, there's no promise the United States can make that will be believed. And there really is the problem. Turning to the economic news, Gary Cohn is out there saying Trump's tax reform is already paying off for more than one million workers. And this was in an interview with Stuart Varney this morning. Uh, and it all sounds very, very positive until you start looking at some of the other things that are going on. Because over at Comcast, they have fired 500 of their people, uh, despite their claims the tax cut would create thousands of jobs. The company literally promised they would create thousands of new jobs in exchange for that big tax cut. And they got the tax cut, and they're firing people. Now, over at Deutsche Bank, which has had scandal after scandal after scandal going back for years and years, right now they're facing a shareholder revolt demanding 660 million pounds compensation over a takeover deal that left them all shortchanged. So Deutsche Bank has been playing fast and loose, and apparently they made a really big mistake and their shareholders demand compensation for the losses they suffered. We're going to do a shout-out now to our honor affiliates who are just now rejoining our network. Now, the other day we were talking about the new tax code, and I said you need to be very careful. We're not going to actually know what's happening until it's fully implemented because they'll give a tax cut one place, then they find a way to take it back someplace else. And the new U.S. tax code amends Internal Revenue Code Section 1031A1 regarding a concept of like-kind exchanges. And this excludes all cryptocurrencies from a previous legal loophole. And so as of now, all cryptocurrency trades represent a taxable 
event. Now, we're starting to get some indications about how the holiday shopping season really worked on out. Macy's has announced they're going to let go 5,000 people and close seven more stores. Their stock took a hit on that. And they're basically saying their holiday sales did go up, but just 1.1% over last year. And last year was a disaster. So it may have been a better Christmas season, but it wasn't good enough. Sears has announced the closings of another 103 stores across the nation. And if you look at the actual article, uh, it'll say which stores are being closed. And apparently starting as soon as the 12th of this month, they'll be uh, holding their closeout sales, where there will be an opportunity uh, to get some real bargains. And the stores are divided. 39 are actual Sears stores, and the other, four, or the other 64 are Kmart stores, which is owned by Sears. Boy, it's hard to imagine a Kmart going out of business, but it is happening. Toshiba uh, has decided to get out of the U.S. nuclear power business, at least as far as Westinghouse. And they've sold the Westinghouse nuclear unit uh, to a group of investment companies led by Brookfield Asset Management for a total of 4.6 billion U.S. dollars. And the deal ends a major headache for Toshiba, which last year warned it might have trouble surviving if it didn't bind, uh, buy and, sorry, find a buyer for the nuclear power plant constructor, which it bought in 2006 for 5 billion. So they're taking a small hit, but not all that much. The other day we were talking about how Pakistan apparently incensed with Donald Trump's uh, cutting of foreign aid to their country, uh, reached a deal with China for direct trade between Pakistan and China based on the yuan. And analysts are now pointing out this brings the yuan on par with the U.S. dollar for investment and trade with Beijing. In other words, they're now equal. So the decline of the dollar is proceeding apace, along with the decline of the U.S. government. And despite all the positive news in the corporate media, the numbers are not looking good. The global debt has hit a record of $233 trillion. And the reason ultimately goes on back to that private central banking model. The vast majority of nations on earth are operating under private central banks, which create the public currency out of thin air and then loan it into circulation at interest. And inevitably, however it happens, the debt grows and grows faster than the available money supply. There is not enough money to pay that debt. So... <clears throat> Private non-financial sector debt hit an all-time high in Canada, France, Hong Kong, South Korea, Switzerland, and Turkey. This does not include the global derivatives exposure, which is an economic nightmare lurking out there in the darkness. And for those who are not up to speed on that, a derivative is a financial instrument who, whose uh, earning or payout is based on another financial transaction. Uh, the simplest derivative is a credit default swap. And the way it works is like insurance. Let's say I'm rich, ooh, would that be nice, and I invest a million dollars in a business. I then buy a credit default swap that will pay out if I lose that other investment. It's loss mitigation, just like insurance. But unlike insurance, uh, derivatives are unregulated. I can buy derivatives on other people's transactions that I have no part with. It's not like regular insurance. I can insure my home for fire, but I can't insure my neighbor's home for fire. And unlike regular insurance, the uh, brokerages that trade in derivatives are not required to keep reasonable cash reserves on hand to pay claims. And back in 2008, 
That's what happened. That's what destroyed those companies on Wall Street. They'd gotten rich selling derivatives. They'd enjoyed the money, paid themselves bonuses. They didn't think the derivatives were ever going to be cashed in because the economy was booming and the real estate bubble was bubbling. And when it all came apart, the people with those derivatives pounded on the doors and said, we want our money. And AIG and some of the other players, they simply collapsed. They didn't have the money. There simply wasn't enough money out there. But having learned nothing from the reckless uh, behavior of derivatives, people are still selling them and people are still buying them. And there is something like, the last number I heard was $4 quadrillion global exposure in the derivatives. In a major global crash, most of those are going to be due and payable. And it's going to be a huge, huge mess. This is over and above that $233 trillion global debt. Larry Lindsay is out there reminding us all that unfunded entitlement liabilities uh, uh, take the U.S. federal debt obligations closer to 300% of the gross domestic product, basically saying that's the degree of trouble Greece was in. Alan Greenspan is, uh, was out there saying, we're not getting like Greece, we're getting like Illinois. And what do you expect when you have a, a monetary system that is based on debt-based currencies? You have to know this is the inevitable consequence of private central banks, as opposed to the honest economic system the United States started with. <clears throat> Apparently, Tesla bonds are tumbling. They're now rated riskier than Indonesia. And it looks like the bond market is starting to give up on Elon Musk's dreams for Tesla's future. Uh, and that really is a shame because, uh, I mean, I haven't driven one, obviously. Uh, can't afford to buy one. But I've seen them close up. I've been shown Teslas by people who've got them. It looks like a really good idea. And despite my criticisms of the carbon Nazis, I do think electric-based cars uh, are the wave of the future once we come up with a non-polluting way to generate that electricity in the first place. Looks like the charging problem uh, is being solved right now. I'd love an electric car. I really would. It's not like Claire and I do a lot of driving uh, around here on the island. Now, as you know, the uh, East Coast just got hit with a major blizzard, and it's being followed by record-setting cold. And this has resulted in a 60-fold surge in prices for U.S. natural gas. And spot prices for fuel used to heat homes and generate power hit a record $175 per million BTUs in New York. And that's a far cry from the $2.93 that U.S. gas futures have been averaging on the New York Mercantile Exchange this winter. So there was a major hit. Apparently over in uh, Europe, Visa has locked down all Bitcoin Visa cards. Banks seem to be fighting back. They, they've decided they do not like this idea of uh, a currency that is not under their control, that is not owned by them. Uh, because that's actually the attitude of the private central bank, of the Federal Reserve. They own all the money. You just borrowed it. You may think you own the money that you get in your paycheck. It's just passing from one borrower to the other, to the other, to the other. And their mindset is it all belongs to them anyway, and they don't like competition. But again, there is no law that says that two people or a neighborhood or a city or a county or a state cannot set up their own alternative medium of exchange, one based on a commodity, uh, one that is a unit of value rather than a unit of debt. On the front of that Federal Reserve note, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. It doesn't say it's the only legal tender. People need to keep that in mind. Getting on over into Europe and immigration issues, the more that Hungary's Orban talks about the disastrous migrant policy of Europe, the more pressure Angela Merkel comes under 
regarding her last-ditch attempt to form a new coalition government because the deadlock between Angela Merkel's party and the other party she needs to create a coalition government is that open border policy. And Viktor Orban is uh, visiting Germany uh, to offer his views on defending Europe's borders. Now, Hungary and Poland are in the process literally of uniting against the Eurocrats. They're out there saying, we don't want to live in an empire. And they're absolutely correct. You need to go on back and remember that the uh, European Union was sold to the people of Europe and the member states as nothing more than a free trade, free travel zone. No passports if you're going from France to Spain. Uh, no tariffs or <clears throat> uh, uh, fees or anything as, as you ship product from one country to the other. And that was a good idea. Uh, it, it really started to work. But over time, Brussels has grabbed more and more authority to itself. All decisions are made by the European Commission. The European Parliament uh, actually has very little power and authority. Uh, they, can, they can vote through a bill which is presented as a recommendation to the European Commission. But the European Commission, which is unelected, makes all the key decisions. It's kind of a lot like the Politburo in the old Soviet Union. And more and more we're hearing dissatisfaction, certainly from the people of Europe. And now we're seeing more and more leaders of Europe who are standing up and saying, this isn't working out. This isn't what we agreed to. Now, down in Great Britain, they're, they're still trying to find a way uh, to reverse the Brexit vote. And now they're pinning their hopes on a new referendum. And their strategy is rather dark and grim, because if you look at the numbers from the Brexit election, uh, the people who voted yes on Brexit tend to, to be the older Britons uh, who remembered what Britain was like before joined the European Union. And so based on that, the Remainers have a new strategy, which I will share with you after these few words. Hello, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about Brexit. We're talking about uh, the, the attempt by the Remainers uh, to basically overturn and ignore the will of the British people, uh, because the British people voted for Brexit, and like Donald Trump's victory, they overcame a huge amount of election fraud uh, to do so. And so the new strategy is focused on the demographic breakdown of that vote because the people who voted to leave the EU tended to be the older generations who remembered what Great Britain was like before it was merged with the European Union. The people who voted to remain were the younger people for whom being part of the EU is just all they've ever known. And so apparently the new strategy is, uh, and uh, this is suggested by Peter Kellner, who's a pollster, uh, he's basically saying uh, that 450,000 Brexiteers die every single year, and so if there's a new referendum in 2020, Remain will, Remain will win. <clears throat> Boy, that's rather sinister. We're, Forget what they voted for. We'll just wait for all those people to die, and then we'll have another election here. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, phony Tony Blair is sticking his nose into the Brexit issue, uh, prompting a rebuttal by Nigel Farage, who pointed out how Tony Blair was wrong on so many things here, was wrong on ERM, wrong on the euro, wrong on Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, and he's wrong on Brexit. So the globalists have not given up yet. They want to glue Britain back to the European Union. They're still talking about the North American Union. And you need to understand that a fundamental difference between nationalists and globalists is nationalists think that nations should be run by leaders elected by the people who live right there in that country, from among the people who live in that country, and look after the country's interests. Globalists do not believe in democracy. 
They think the planet should be run by administrators chosen by them and following policies set by whatever experts they are listening to to do what they think is best for society and the planet, regardless of what the population wants. I don't know about you, I would not want to live in a society like that. I wouldn't want my descendants to live in a society like that. And being a frustrated daddy, I think I've expressed on the air many times uh, how much I regret that the one opportunity where I nearly became a father didn't work out. But there have been times recently where I look at the state of the world and part of me is saying maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. Now, over at Investment Watch blog, they ran a story saying that it is time to stop counting illegal aliens in the census because there are so many of them. They're distorting the census results. And as one example, California has so many illegal immigrants. Uh, they have extra House seats. They have more seats in the House of Representatives than they ought to have based on the legal citizens in the state of California. And one of the problems we have is that these illegal immigrants are being brought on in specifically to red states to try and turn them blue. This is in-your-face election fraud because these illegal aliens are not allowed to vote, which is why, at the very least, we've got to mandate voter ID. Our election system is a joke. It's an absolute joke. I don't know if it's still out there someplace on Hulu or not, uh, but there was this wonderful movie, I think it was called Recount, uh, starred Kevin Spacey, about that debacle in Florida back in 2000. And you watch that movie and realize this all really happened. And I imagine about five years or so, we'll get a movie made about last year's primaries and general election and all the fraud that was going on with that. We, the American people, need to demand an honest election system. And again, I'm very disappointed, uh, first of all, in the states that stonewalled Trump's uh, Election Integrity Commission, and then I'm more disappointed that Trump capitulated and dissolved it, because... I don't think the Department of Homeland Security is going to do a thing about this issue. It's going to be up to us, we the American people. And I would urge everybody to read the article I wrote on how to have honest elections, or at least more honest elections. And uh, it's on the main page of what really happened. It's permanently linked up at the top, right underneath my photograph. And I urge you to read that article, and if you agree with it, copy it off and just Send it to everybody that you know. We need to raise public awareness of this problem. And if you have not seen it, there's an HBO uh, documentary called Hacking Democracy. And it, in turn, focuses on Bev Harris and her website, blackboxvoting.org. And Bev has just done amazing work through the years exposing how these electronic machines are intentionally designed to steal elections. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Hi, America. Welcome back to the show here. And before we go back to the uh, telephones here, a story coming out here now where Michael Wolf, the author of Fire and Fury, is now admitting he's not sure how much of his book is really true. Uh, he's out there now saying he thinks some of these people were lying. His excuse now is that he put it all out there in the book to let the reader decide for themselves what's true and what isn't. And this, of course, makes no sense at all, because ordinary readers, uh, such as yours truly, we have no way to know, because we weren't there. This is pure propaganda, and I think it's being done to support this push to get Trump out of the Oval Office on the uh, 25th uh, Amendment. But it's already coming apart. All right, we're going to take a phone call. Nick in England. Aloha, Nick. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Oh, hello, Mike. Thanks so much for taking my call. I, um, I'm a long-time listener to your show. It's the first time I've rung in, so thanks for, for taking the call. I wanted to just touch on what you were talking about just now about um, this uh, ridiculous strategy of waiting to, till the Brexiteers 
die off. Um, I mean, it's quite, uh, it's been pretty obvious that's something they've been looking to do before. And I, the thing that comes up to me in my mind is, uh, you know, is this a, like a women's singles game in, in a Grand Slam? Is this the best of three or is it, you know, or is it the best of five? I know that the European Union has a long history of uh, wrong result, vote again and vote again to get the right vote. So I, yes. think, I don't think anybody's too surprised about this. But the thing that really, um, the thing that gives me hope is that the people that come out to, um, to, to, to parade the value of staying in, these are all discredited has-been politicians. And to me, people like, I mean, Tony Blair is really, really, uh, since he left office, his, his, his reputation has taken a huge nosedive. And the fact that it's like he's the best person they can put, put forward um, is a great sign of weakness in my mind. And, I mean, it was very clear to me that he's a, you know, go for bag carrier for the globalists. I mean, the morning uh, that the, the Brexit uh, poll was announced, uh, I was watching it on live TV. It was an amazing drama. And there he was, Tony Blair, turning up at the offices of the, Rema of the Brexit offices um, early in the morning. And I was thinking, well, what on earth is he doing there? And so it's pretty obvious that, that he was going to be one of the leading emissaries to, um, to reverse the results. But I, I, people don't in this country have any respect for him at all. And... Um, as I say, it's a bit like, you know, if you're, well, we play cricket in England, we don't play baseball, but I mean, if he's the best batter or batsman to send out to bat for you, I think it shows a great deal of weakness, and that, that does encourage me, um, you know, enormously. Well, I, uh, I, I think, uh, looking I, objectively, uh, the globalists are, are losing ground, uh, because there's a huge pushback. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, the European nations are, are just... Uh, angry over the open borders. We, we've got problems in, in this country caused by unregulated uh, immigration. Uh, people are beginning to realize that there is an ongoing attack uh, on our very identities, our history, our cultural icons. Uh, uh, they started with the Confederate flag and then Confederate statues. They're trying to erase all history to, to basically create a population with no real sense of who they are so that they can be mixed together, hopefully without friction, but, of course, it really didn't work out very well, as you can tell by what's going on in Europe. And it's another classic case of too much policy being set by wishful thinking. And we get a lot of that from the uh, liberal establishment, uh, who just imagine something is going to work this way, and then they get out in the real world, uh, and it doesn't work out that way, and they look for somebody to blame. Uh, a good example is the open borders issue, and all these people are flooding into Europe, and then all of a sudden violent crime goes up, rape goes up, burglary goes up, uh, and all these countries are now having to admit there's a major increase in crime that is directly tied to the flood of migrants. Uh, and uh, the, the globalists are out there saying, oh, the, the, the media is just paying too much attention to it. Or you have these ridiculous politicians who are out there saying, well, you know, we've had these problems all along. Like I think it was uh, uh, Sidi Khan the other day came on out and said, uh, there's always been uh, uh, rape gangs in, in Britain, uh, which is just an absolute flat-out lie. It's a phenomenon that showed up only recently and is being run by the, the migrants. Uh, so there, there's going to be a fight, uh, and ultimately I, I think it'll, that'll be a big part of the coming global war, uh, is the nations that uh, support globalism at war with the nations that support nationalism. Well, one of the interesting things to me about, I mean, Tony Blair is one of these politicians that I have just taken, an in, I took an instant dislike to him years and years ago, is that it, it transpires after he left office that, um, of course, they opened the doors. They, they, they even, you know, Peter Mandelson, his uh, ex Bengali guy, was on record then as they were sending out search parties to have foreigners come into the country. But this was done under the, the uh, cloak of the highest secrecy because uh, you mustn't discuss it in public. Um, and there's always been this thing of, uh, you know, Tony Blair knows best, um, extraordinary level of arrogance. One of the things that, of, on him personally that I found really extraordinary, there was a, a book about him uh, by a journalist called Tom Bauer, or Bowie, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, called Broken Vows. And um, in that, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole kind of, you know, he, he was a very good journalist, he interviewed lots and lots of people, and he's talking about the Iraq War. 
and how they were having all these discussions in Downing Street with all these various generals and things. And some of these, these generals are saying to him, look, you can't do this. And about the after-war planning, but, you know, they didn't have enough uh, equipment for the soldiers. And mm-hmm. it was just completely impractical. You can't do this. You've got to think of it. And so he, but apparently, according to his book, from eyewitness accounts, he just kind of looked at them with this, you know, he's got this grin, this grin that he has. And he just said, well, that's sort of just the way it is. And you just read through through the lines of that, you think, well, he was just carrying out orders. You know, he was just not in control of the agenda. He was clearly there to to pursue the war, and that's just the way it is. Um, well, you need to remember that, in- that, that one year before the Iraq War really got going, Tony Blair uh, flew down to Texas and had a private meeting uh, with George W. Bush, uh, and this was right after Iraq... Uh, got permission from the United Nations to sell their oil for the euro instead of the dollar. And so apparently uh, George Bush and Tony Blair decided at that point there was going to be a war against Iraq uh, to bring Iraq's oil back under the U.S. dollar. And that's been driving a lot of these wars all over the globe, trying to prop up the U.S. dollar uh, by using other people's natural resources. Great. Well, um, uh, that's all I got for you today. Thanks very much for, for the call. It was, it was well, great to thank, talk to you. thank you very much uh, for the call. You gave us a lot of good information, and uh, please call again. I'll look forward to it. Bye. All right. Thanks an awful lot. We're going to let you go. Now then, again, back to Sadiq Khan. And uh, as you know, he kicked up a, a, a bit of a fuss with this claim that there have always been rape gangs in Britain. And this is just normal life, and you should just get used to it. Try telling that to one of the uh, young girls who've been raped or recruited and forced into prostitution, if this is something that they're going to get used to. But it, it is ridiculous here. Now Sadiq Khan has uh, done something else that a lot of people are looking at askance, uh, along with all the other crimes that are skyrocketing uh, with the migrant influx, uh, there are knife crimes because knives are still, for the most part, legal uh, in Great Britain. And Sadiq Khan decided they were going to try and solve the problem by spending £10,000 on knife wands for schools, by which they mean uh, handheld metal detectors. But... City Hall is not going to track and report how much they're being used or how many knives are being confiscated, if any. It's something Sadiq Khan is doing just to make it look like Sadiq Khan is doing something about the problem. And the problem is going to be solved when you close those borders and become selective as to who you allow into your country. That is the only workable solution. Everything else is a panacea. We're going to go back to the telephones now, and we're going to go to Jeff in Calgary. Aloha, Jeff. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Yeah, hi, Mike. I haven't called in a while. Expatriate here. Uh, I'm really surprised that the, shall we say, alternative media hasn't covered the developments in the Vegas shooting more closely. And and maybe you've covered this. There's two things I want to ask. One, were were you aware of the audio tape that was uh, posted to YouTube that has the air traffic control of the Vegas airport saying active shooters are on the runway? Uh, I heard about it. I didn't hear the tape itself, but there's something you need to keep in mind. Uh, Apparently, the Mandalay Bay Hotel hired a public relations firm to try and toss a lot of junk about the Mandalay Bay shooting onto the Internet uh, in order uh, to basically keep the issue confused, keep people from uh, arriving at a consensus as to what happened, and potentially just to burn out the issue so people would stop talking about it and gamblers would start to come back to that hotel and casino as quickly as possible. Uh, And there is a lot of utter nonsense out there uh, about what actually happened. But I think we can all discard that and come to the agreement. We understand that what actually happened that night is not what the official story says it is. We all agree to agree on that. We got lied to again. Let's just figure out what we're going to do about that. I, I get it. Uh, that audio is out there. If you just YouTube search Vegas shooter, shooter on run- runway, you'll find it. Uh, Joel Skousen seems legit. It sounds legit. Um, 
that's from what I can tell from a cursory search, nobody's debunked it yet. So, okay, so that's one thing. The other is this uh, Jesus Campos. Well, before you go any further, uh, before before yep. you go any further, okay, uh, let's stipulate there was a shooter on the runway. What did he shoot? Because there have been no reports of bullet holes in people or aircraft. Oh, that's a good point. Now, uh, Joel Skousen, uh, you can look up one of his uh, speeches he gave before the end of this last calendar year. He said there are photos do exist of bullets um, hitting the fence at the runway. I, I would have to go back and look that up. That would be the only evidence I know in that case. Okay. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at a map. I, I know that the airport was fairly close to the Mandalay Bay, uh, and bullets right. could have reached that far. But that would not have been a shooter on the runway. And, again, the air traffic controller may have heard something over one of the other radios and misquoted it. Uh, it's not like it's a primary source of information. Uh, but at this point, uh, like Oklahoma City, like 9-11, uh, I'm letting Mandalay Bay fade into history because we have things we need to be looking at right now, like Uranium One, the Clinton Foundation, rigged elections, things that are very pressing and, and current. Well, yeah, I, I encourage you to go for it. I would just uh, keep your antenna up. I think the next thing would would be a turning point with this, if there was a greater conspiracy, would be when the judge grants or doesn't grant discovery to the many law firms uh, engaged in lawsuits for this. This would be a uh, something that would reveal new facts. So just keep your antenna up for that. But other than that, uh, keep pressing ahead, uh, Mike, in 2018. God bless. All right, thanks an awful lot. We're going to let you go here. The phone lines are open now if you want to call on in. <clears throat> Pardon me. Getting on back to the economic news, uh, there appears to be a trade war breaking out inside the European Union, which was supposed to be a free trade area. But the argument is, is apparently uh, with Russia, and apparently Russia has banned imports of European Union pork. And this is part of Russia's measured response to continuing sanctions against Russia. Uh, every time uh, these sanctions were imposed, European pro uh, producers of various products suffered. I remember this uh, uh, photo where French farmers uh, had dumped truckloads of rotted crops uh, at the steps of government buildings because they couldn't sell them anymore, because their primary customers have been in Russia. Well, now Putin is banning imports of European Union pork, and Brussels has decided uh, this uh, requires compensation to the tune of 1.4 billion euros. And they're going to take this case to the World Trade Organization arbitration panel. And this could lead to the World Trade Organization beginning to fracture. Because I imagine that given that the World Trade Organization has been of almost zero use uh, in trying to uh, deal with the sanctions war, that Russia might just withdraw and say, we're not part of this anymore. I mean, there, there comes a point where you've sanctioned a country so much that more sanctions just become ineffective. You're up against the law of diminishing returns. And I think with regard to a lot of countries, Russia, Iran, the U.S. and the West have already hit that point. We're going to sanction you more. You've already sanctioned everything. Go ahead and sanction away. We could care less. Uh, now, getting back to the United States here. Wisconsin is the latest of 24 states that have passed laws intended to punish companies and individuals that support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement that intends to stop Israel's oppression of Palestinians. And obviously this is a violation of our First Amendment right to freedom of speech because boycotts are an internationally recognized form of peaceful protest. But there's another legal wrinkle in there that these laws passed by these 24 states may violate the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. And again, I would chastise the government of these 24 states and remind them that their primary concern is that state and not what's happening over on the other side of the world. 
No government can serve two masters. And a government that serves Israel cannot, does not, and will not serve the American people. And in these very trying times, America needs leaders who will put America first, second, and third. We don't have the luxury, we don't have the money, we don't have the resilience to have our leaders ignoring their jobs here at home in order to help Israel. Now, we're coming up here on another break. When we come on back, we're going to be talking about Jeff Sessions, who may not be doing anything about Hillary's possible espionage, uh, who may not be doing anything about the Clinton Foundation, but boy, is he at war with marijuana. And we'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. And Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. And uh, Jeff Sessions, uh, he's in high dudgeon. The glove is up. He's angry. He's, he's uh, unleashed his legions of federal prosecutors to go into those states that have decriminalized marijuana or have provisions for medical marijuana, and he's going to stop these weed heads. And he's on fire for that. We've got to preserve those fine American traditions like whiskey and cigars. And they're under threat from this plant that you can grow in your own yard. By golly. And, uh, of course, if they start doing more arrests for marijuana, that's going to be a boon to the uh, private prisons industry. They're going to start filling up. Huzzah, huzzah. More taxpayer money to lock up these people for smoking uh, a little bit of a plan. And as it turns out, apparently some of Sessions' aides are tied in with the private prison industry. You can see how all of this stuff works. But apparently... They're about ready to add a, a new impediment uh, to our lives. Uh, there's an advisor to Jeff Sessions. His name is Dr. Robert DuPont. He's supposedly an ex expert on uh, drug abuse issues. And he is the guy who came up with the idea that marijuana is a gateway drug. That if you smoke a marijuana cigarette, you will automatically get sucked down to the depths of heroin or cocaine or meth addiction. There is no stopping it. Because everybody who's on those drugs started with marijuana. Actually, no, they all started with glasses of milk. That's how silly the whole situation is. But now, Dr. Robert DuPont uh, is out there. He wants doctors to drug test everyone. So that if you have to go into uh, your doctor, uh, as Claire has had to do for the flu, uh, among everything else, there would be a drug test which adds more cost to your doctor's visit. And I see a major problem if that goes forward. People who need medical treatment might avoid it rather than risk a positive drug test. And by the way, the, uh, the, the quick and dirty drug test that's used by law enforcement gets a lot of false positives. So this, this is going to harm people getting medical care. People who are smoking marijuana, they get ill, uh, they're going to try and stay home and tough it out. And maybe they will. Maybe they'll get better. It's not like American medical care is of high quality. But those who are seriously ill, they could get worse. They could die. And again, it's a Fourth Amendment violation to drug test everyone because there has to be evidence of a crime before they start sticking needles into you. Now, Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, has issued a warning, I guess is an appropriate word, to Donald Trump on the issue of marijuana, uh, saying that if uh, Trump continues to stop states from legalizing marijuana, Scott Adams says he's going to turn on the president faster than anyone has ever turned on him. And there have been a lot of turnings of late. And the reason for Scott Adams' ire is very simple. During the campaign, Donald Trump said he favored marijuana legalization. We'll be right back after station identification. Aloha, America. Welcome back to our show, hour number three. The phone lines are open, 800-313-9443. Now, the New York Times uh, just came out with a story where special counsel Robert Mueller uh, is looking back at how Trump 
had the uh, top White House lawyer try and convince Attorney General Jeff Sessions not to recuse himself from the Russia probe. Uh, but, of course, Sessions went ahead and uh, recused himself, and we got Mueller and the current mess. But Robert Mueller uh, is now investigating uh, whether that order or that suggestion uh, represents a prosecutable obstruction of justice, which that is a bit of a reach. But there's a revelation there. If he's over there looking at whether uh, Trump wanting Sessions to investigate uh, the Russia collusion issue uh, is obstruction of justice, it's another reminder that Mueller never found any evidence of Trump-Russia collusion. And as Paul Manafort has made very, very clear in his lawsuit, that's outside Mueller's mission statement. Mueller was appointed to investigate Trump-Russia collusion. He's found zero evidence of it. And so once again, he's on a fishing expedition, trying to appear that he's relevant, trying to get Donald Trump. Now, do you remember a while back, there was this professor, George uh, uh, Chicarillo Mayer, at Drexel University, and he was uh, forced to re resign from Drexel University uh, over a tweet in which he said, all I want for Christmas is white genocide. And today he's announced uh, that New York University has hired him. And New York University says that his status is as a visiting scholar, but it is an unpaid appointment. Basically, all New York University is doing is they're letting him on the campus. Now, this one I think is going to upset a lot of people. Uh, and I'm going to preface it by reminding you all of a story that came out a couple of weeks ago, where in Sweden, the church is being directed to talk about God and Jesus in non-gender terms which is going to make it very tricky when you're talking about the Son of God. I guess they're going to go to Child of God or some other word here. And I think a lot of people uh, are, are saying that this gender neutral uh, has gone way too far because the world is what the world is. Beliefs are what the beliefs are. And trying to rewrite them uh, is going to anger a lot of people. So in that same vein... An elite liberal arts college, Swarthmore College, is offering a class called Queering the Bible for the coming fall semester, uh, in which it promises to, quote, destabilize long-held assumptions, end quote, about what the Bible says about gender. And the course description basically says the course will survey queer and trans readings of biblical texts, texts, while introducing students to the complexities of construction of sex, gender, and identity in one of the most influential literary works produced in ancient times. It's a very long-winded way of saying they're going to try and retell the Bible in gender-neutral terms. And uh, there, is, there is some meat in there because there, there are some hints of homosexuality in a positive light in various parts of the Bible. I'm not going to go into that right now here. Uh, but I have two concerns. One is that this gender nonsense has gone way too far. Somebody just sent me a very clever cartoon saying that if I had a dollar for every one of the genders that are out there, I would have two dollars and a whole pile of counterfeits, which I think really does state it. But this... It really did get ridiculous, and I think it's part of trying to keep us all confused about who we are and what we are. It's part of the New World Order. Now, over in Germany, uh, a, a brief shining moment of common sense. Germany's top court has ruled that a transsexual woman whose frozen sperm was used to fertilize an egg can only be registered as the child's father. 
and the court rejected the woman's appeal against a lower court ruling, preventing her from being legally listed as the child's mother. Now, the woman changed sex in 2012, and her partner gave birth to a child three years later using the plaintiff's sperm. It almost reminds me of that Monty Python, uh, that scene from uh, Life of Brian, where this one guy says, I want to be a woman, I want to have babies, and the other one is saying, you don't have a womb. There's nowhere for the fetus to gestate. And it does almost seem like there's a war between reality and this fantasy world of all the snowflakes. We're going to do a shout-out to our on-air affiliates who are just now rejoining the network. Here's another example of an out-of-control social system. Uh, This is a story that appeared over in womensystems.com. And basically, it has to do with a gentleman, uh, 63 years old. His name is Eugene Wright, and he's retired. And he was outside his home in June of last year when Meadville Police and a representative with Stairways Behavioral Health confronted him, and they explained that they were there because at 10 o'clock that morning, Eugene Wright was at an orthopedic office threatening people, and Eugene was not at the orthopedic office. He was still working at that time. He was about to retire, and he was at work, and the police and Stairways Behavioral Health never checked his identity. And the police hauled him off to Meadville Medical Center, where apparently doctors injected Wright with Haldol, which is an antipsychotic medication, and Ativan, which is used to treat anxiety disorders. And apparently, after a while, they realized they had the wrong guy, after giving him all this Melcher brain medication, and they apologized. And to show how sorry they were, They gave him a $50 gift card to a local steakhouse. That should make it all better. Well, Eugene said no, and he's filed a lawsuit. And he really should. It's terrible. Now, over in Oklahoma, and Jeff Sessions is going to be unhappy about this, on the uh, June primaries this year, Oklahoma voters will get Uh, a chance to vote their opinion uh, regarding medical marijuana legalization. It's state question 788 on the primary election ballot. This is going to shape up to a state's rights issue. And again, remember, when the United States was set up by the founding fathers, the states were sovereign entities. They were basically nations unto themselves, And they were working uh, basically as a collective under that central government, which was there to regulate interstate commerce, basically arbitrate disputes between the states, and that was it. Same thing with the European Union. It's just we're a bunch of separate sovereign states. We're going to work together, and it's turned into something else entirely. That's why the name of this country is the United States, plural, of America. The states were supposed to be sovereign. So at some point, I think there's going to be a big states' right issue over this, possibly even a constitutional crisis. Now, getting back to the issue of governments just messing with our lives to justify their power and their pay and enlargement, uh, a lot of people, when they lose their jobs, they're turning to other entrepreneurial activities. Uh, And one that is very common is uh, to make baked goods at home and then sell them. And in 49 states, this is perfectly legal. But apparently in New Jersey, it is not. And there was this woman who lost her job, and she started supplementing her income by baking things in her home and selling them to friends and neighbors. And apparently uh, the, the state has come down on her very hard, saying that uh, selling just one cake, one cookie, one muffin, the fine can be as high as $1,000.
because by golly, we've got to protect our friends over there in the commercial baking industry. We can't have people making and selling baked goods at home. That cuts into the profits, and profits are above all. If you really think about it, that's what lies behind a lot of laws that you wonder, why is this here? It's there to take away from the American people their ability to make or grow things for themselves and make them dependent on commercial for-profit operations. That's what's behind all these zoning laws that say you can't grow vegetables on your own property. It's just incredible rampant greed and fascism. Now, a little bit of good news. Do you remember over in New York they had this surveillance program on mosques? Well, it's been shut down. And apparently New York's mayor has killed off the mosque surveillance program and is diverting the money uh, to security infrastructure, which I presume is more cameras, more microphones, uh, and things like that. All right, let's get back to computers here because there's a lot going on here. Apple has admitted that all iPhones, iPads, and Macs are at risk from these uh, Intel and ARM chip design flaws slash backdoors that could expose billions of people's personal data to hackers. Every one of these devices are at risk of being hacked. And uh, these are basically the meltdown and specter bugs discovered by security researchers. And these are actually in the metal of the chip. And again, it's a legitimate question. Are these really design flaws? Or given how similar the outcome of the flaws are, are these in fact mandated NSA backdoors? And Apple is warning its customers to only download software for its platforms from trusted sources like the App Store. But even the App Store has been comp uh, compromised on a couple of occasions. And what's really ironic about all of this is back when Apple was first launching, going up against the Windows-based machines, their big selling point was that Apples were safe from hackers. That if you were on Windows, there was all those viruses and malware, and because Apple had this closed architecture, uh, you were safe from this kind of thing. And they sold a lot of machines to concerned people. And it wasn't that Apple was really that more secure. There just weren't enough of them to make it worthwhile for the cyber criminals uh, to write new malware to go after those platforms. They were making plenty of money off the Windows owners, uh, and uh, there, there weren't enough apples back then, but there are now. And so I find it ironic, looking back uh, at all those commercials they did about how safe and secure Apple products were. Wrong. Now, Intel is claiming that its new security updates will make 90% of modern PCs and phones immune uh, to these chip bugs slash backdoors. Uh, but experts are saying that, uh, no, it may not be fixable. It may not, they may not be able to fix it. Uh, and the patches are a temporary fix. And there needs to be a more permanent solution, physically built into future microprocessors. Some people are even saying it may be time for the x86 line of processors to simply go away. Now, Linus Torvalds, the inventor and founder of the Linux operating system, uh, he's very outspoken, and he's got a lot of opinions. And he is now one of the loudest critics of Intel's handling of Meltdown, the flaw revealed Wednesday, or the back door, that could enable an attacker to steal confidential information, including passwords. And again, what you need to understand is inside the computer device, uh, memory is partitioned off into uh, areas of increasing security. And the most secure one is the kernel memory the memory that is directly accessed by the, the core of the operating system. And that is not supposed to be writable from outside or readable from outside, certainly not from outside the physical device. 
but these bugs slash back doors on the chips make that possible. So Linus is out there saying that he thinks somebody inside of Intel really needs to take a hard look at the CPO, CPUs and actually admit they have problems instead of investing all this money on public relations blurbs to say that everything works as designed. Remember Intel and the original Pentium chip? That had a hardware problem in the uh, divide function. And people were actually getting wrong numeric results until a patch was issued for that as well. So... This may be an opportunity for anybody who wants to start a new chip company. Come up with a new simple, elegant, secure, fast chip. Make sure it really does work and the world will beat a path to your door. One item that crossed my desk about this issue is that apparently uh, this uh, bug slash back door uh, is exploited on computers that have more than one core in the CPU. Now, these days, pretty much every CPU out there is uh, dual-core, quad-core, eight-core. Uh, but for some of the really old machines out there that only had a single-core CPU, they appear to be immune. Now, here's a big stink about to happen, and I'm sure the stockholders in Intel are not going to be happy about that. Uh, Intel CEO Brian Kuzanich uh, basically sold off $24 million dollars uh, in Intel stock that he owned before the announcement was made. And Intel was aware of the chip vulnerability. They, they, they were working on it, strategizing their conformity, trying to figure out how they were going to survive the storm. Uh, and so he sold off his stock knowing there was going to be a problem in the future, but before the problem was publicly known. I think that would qualify as insider trading. More woes for Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard is again forced to recall laptops over problematic batteries that could burst into flames. And apparently the issue affects devices sold worldwide between December 2015 and December of last year, a week ago. And it's only a small number of laptops that have the problematic batteries. Uh, because Hewlett Packard gets the batteries from multiple uh, vendors, uh, but they're now offering a downloadable uh, uh, tool where you can tell if you've got the bad batteries. And if you do, uh, there's an option in the tool to turn the battery off. You can still use the laptop plugged into the wall. You just can't take it with you until you get a replacement battery. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a phone call. Glenn in California, thank you for waiting so patiently. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. Uh, just wanted to throw a little bit of information at you about the Apple issue uh, as far as the security. Um, they developed that OS. When they started that ad campaign, uh, the operating system that they used was based on FreeBSD, which is one of the oldest Unix systems that was developed by it's the second MIT oldest. and Berkeley. Yes, yeah, one of the yeah, one of the oldest. Yeah, so, so I love it was, BSD. and then they uh, had an op- yeah, right, and and then they had an open source project called Darwin uh, that a- actually developed the kernel that they used for the system. So it is inherently much more secure than Windows, which was originally well, designed. Well, Glenn, for Glenn, the, Glenn, I'm, uh, Glenn, I'm going to Glenn, I'm going to have to put you on hold. We got to take a break for commercials. Don't hang up. Uh, because I want to come back to this topic. We'll be right back. Aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're talking with Glenn in California about the Apple and the history of Apple's operating system. And before I give the microphone back to you, I have to challenge your comment that uh, B, uh, uh, BSD uh, uh, Unix was all that secure because it wasn't. Uh, it's just that in those early days, uh, there weren't a lot of people who were engaged in trying to play games with it. Uh, you had the Morris worm uh, that paralyzed the Internet on uh, Unix machines here. And I did a quick web search on the commercial, and I found a, a hacking tutorial against Unix in 1990. There just wasn't a lot of it going on there. But anyway, continue your story. 
Yeah, well, I just I agree with you. I mean, Apple's pretty much gone in the toilet, and we can definitely kind of see trends as to when Steve Jobs was there and when kind of government uh, backdoors were being allowed in and out. You know, yes. <laughs> I think he was he was the the guy that was kind of keeping them alive, and and since he's been gone, it's just you know gone to heck. And of course, nothing's going to uh, protect you against something that's burnt into the chip. But, and, you know, if you look at, at the difference, yes, there were ways to hack Unix, uh, but it was much more difficult than Windows because Windows was never designed to uh, be run on a mainframe with multiple users. It was designed to just, you know, I, I set up a lot of servers in my lifetime. Yes, and so did uh, I. between Linux, Windows, and uh, a- Apple servers, the Apple servers were the ones that would run, I'd have uptime for years on those things. So it was just, you know, they, they, they were more secure, but you're right. You definitely need to, to be watching. I think there's a false sense of security, and they've, uh, they've, they've gone in the toilet <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm fuzzy on this, but uh, <clears throat> I remember reading a book, uh, The Cuckoo's Egg. I think it was about a guy named Kevin Mitnick, and uh, the guy who, who caught him, identified him, uh, I think that involved uh, Mitnick uh, hacking into a Unix server as well. But I could – this is many, many years ago I read this. But, again, uh, uh, really back then there just weren't that many people who were playing these games. Uh, there wasn't a lot of money to be made on it. People weren't keeping their personal financial banking information on Unix mainframes. So there wasn't much point to it. Uh, and, uh, unfortunately, the nature of cybercrime has evolved right alongside the degree of technology. But I just found it ironic that uh, Apple's uh, advertising push to say that they were far more secure than uh, Windows uh, is very ironic looking at it uh, now that uh, uh, for the last 20 years uh, their, their products have had this problem. Uh, so, <clears throat> right. I, yeah. And don't get me wrong, yeah, well, I, I like I, Apple products. I have an iPhone. Uh, uh, my wife used to have a MacBook uh, that she used uh, to print her sheet music on uh, until the day the magic smoke escaped from inside. Because we all know computers run with magic smoke. If the magic smoke escapes, the computer stops working. <laughs> I remember one time I saw a, a Mac, you know, this the little boxy desktop. I saw one of those go, and the smoke was bright orange. It was Everyone's like applauding wow. fireworks show. <laughs> well, I have to agree with you that you know you, you definitely need to be careful with all of them. But if I had a choice between Linux, Windows, and the Mac as far as security and usability, the Mac OS is still better. Uh, yes. But you know, no, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, if I had the financial resources, I'd rather be running. Uh, on uh, MacBooks, Mac computers here at home uh, for Claire and her music and for what I do here. Uh, we're constrained on the Windows systems by lower cost and the lower cost of the software. Uh, I do have a Linux box. In fact, I have three of them. Uh, and uh, I'm having a lot of fun uh, with the Raspberry Pi architecture. And it, do, it does bring back memories of the glory days of uh, the Berkeley Standard Distribution. And where I learned Unix uh, BSD was at Robert Abel and Associates because all of the early software uh, for visual effects and computer animation was developed on Berkeley Unix. And we had a source code license. We had the source code for the, all the operating system and all the utilities. Uh, and it was a great learning opportunity. And uh, a big part of my job when I was there, I wrote a lot of code. I wrote a lot of software to, uh, you know, because back then you couldn't go to the store and just buy it off the shelf. If you didn't write it yourself, you didn't mm-hmm. get it done. Yeah, and and that's that's what I really liked about the Mac is that you did have that combination of commercial software, but you had the power of all the development tools right there. You have the command line, you've got you know the all the Unix tools, plus all the Apple development tools were included for free, whereas Microsoft was charging thousands and thousands of dollars for development tools. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've never no. I've never really fallen in love with Microsoft's uh, development system. Uh, it's uh, it seems almost intentionally designed for multi personnel departments and not uh, for uh, the individual 
uh, person who just wants to write a little utility. Anyway, listen, Glenn, thank you for the information and the walk down memory lane here. Uh, we're going to take a break for commercials. Yeah, we have another caller waiting on the line, and we'll be right back after these few words. Hello. <clears throat> Pardon me. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show. We're going to go to the telephones now. John in Missouri, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your uh, mind? Hi, Mike. Uh, with the Congress approval in the toilet and uh, the incumbents being able to get reelected at about 90-some percent, how, how, how do we ever get out of this? Well, I, I've been saying it for a very long time that I think our central federal government is headed for a Soviet Union-style collapse. They're just going to fall apart. We may even be seeing the beginning of it with all these renewed investigations and accusations going back and forth. Uh, and I think that would be the best option for everybody because when it happened to the Soviet Union, very few people were, were harmed. Uh, it was a relatively bloodless regime change. And uh, it's going to be followed by some months of very difficult times. And we're going to have to learn how to uh, take care of ourselves. We're going to have to learn new community skills. Uh, relying on our friends and neighbors, sharing resources uh, to get through the hard times while we put a new government together that's based on some common sense. And that is what I think is ultimately going to happen. This government is irredeemably corrupt. Uh, what we saw with all of these so-called investigations uh, into Hillary and the Clinton Foundation and Uranium One, uh, the government is non-functional in terms of what it's supposed to do for the nation and the American people. Uh, uh, the last... Three presidents have not been administrations. It's just been one continuing crime spree. That's what I've seen. <laughs> yep. As much as I like it here, I, and there's nowhere else to go, I might add. Yeah, I that's, just, that's the problem with the modern world. There's no, there's no more frontier out there. I mean, uh, if it had been possible I, I, when I was much younger, obviously I couldn't do it in my 60s, uh, I, I would have gotten a Conestoga wagon put Claire in there and said, let's just get away from all this nonsense. Head on out. Be a homesteader. Well, it ain't a bad thought, but uh, I guess it ain't practical anymore. Well, that there's was no just place my, to go. Wonder, and I, I, uh, I just get really confused because they don't even want to hide it anymore. That's the part that amazes me. They don't even want to hide their, their shame. <laughs> Well, I think they so, want to hide anyway. it. We've, we've just reached a flashpoint where they can't anymore. Uh, and if there's one thing that we can point to as a victory for the independent media, it is that we have taken away from the government and the corporate media their ability to lie to the public with impunity. Uh, and without that, yeah, Americans are looking at what's going on. Uh, they're very skeptical of the official story. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's definitely a, a growing movement among the American people uh, that the federal government is, at very best, it's useless, and at very worst, it is a danger to the American people. You're absolutely right. Mike, thanks for your time. All right, well, thank you very much as well, and uh, we're going to switch over to Matt in the high desert. Aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I live out here in the high desert near San, in San Bernardino County. Yes, and uh, they're spraying the hell out of us with these chemtrails right now. I mean, you you can see it actually floating down and uh, a mud, you know, just along the the mountain okay. mountains, and you can see. You well, thank you for the update. Thank you for Horrible. the update, and we're going to let you go and uh, get on back to the news because we got a lot of things to cover before uh, the end of our program and the start of the weekend. Now, yesterday we were talking about how communities are starting to set up their own municipal net neutral high bandwidth internet to serve their communities. And there was an attempt by the cable company uh, to go to the courts and say, no, you can't do that. You must be dependent on us, and we're going to give priority access to the internet uh, to the guys with the money, uh, which people are not happy with. Now, interestingly enough, there was an open comment period when the FCC was looking at this issue, and there were 22 million comments entered on the website, and quite a few of them were negative, and a great many were positive, 
but somebody realized the positives ones were being generated by bots. In any event, uh, in the 218-page net neutrality uh, repeal document issued by the FCC, none of the comments uh, were quoted, not one consumer comment. They just knew what they were going to do, and they did it. But I really think the idea of a municipal Internet, that's a good idea. That's definitely a good idea. Now, apparently, uh, the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, has now canceled his planned appearance at the Consumer Electronics Show because of continuing death threats. <clears throat> I think going the way of municipal Internet is a much better solution, just so that you have that. Let's take another phone call. Rick in Arizona, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Yeah, you were talking about Intel. You know, any chip manufacturer that would build chips in Israel, I would not have in my computer. A long time ago, I, I stuck with, with uh, AMD. I've known their friendship with Israel for a long time. Yes. Now, as far as Trump goes, and all these scandals, we're going to be hearing the same crap seven years from now with uh, Mueller and Rosenstein because they can't crack this case open because it's just going to expose too many people in Washington, D.C. are interconnected with the media, with the, all the, all the uh, alphabet agencies. There's no way. Well, I disagree. As I mentioned earlier in the program, all it's going to take is one person who's, you know, facing prosecution uh, to panic uh, and start hurling accusations, uh, and then the accusations are going to fly, and the, the story is going to crack despite the best efforts to keep it together. Right now, that whole shell yeah, around I the corruption, that's Humpty Dumpty. Uh, and when it falls, all the king's horses and all the king's men are not going to be able to put it back together again. Now, we know that uh, Hillary Clinton has the dirt on a lot of the worst of the skullduggery committed by the United States government through the years, and that is her weapon. She's able to blackmail the entire government to protect her, and we saw it on display uh, during the investigations leading up to the election, uh, the FBI's uh, letting her walk clear on felony Title 18 violations, uh, and we may see it displayed again for a second time. But having announced these renewed investigations, if they still draw a blank, that's only going to further weaken the credibility and legitimacy of the United States government. I think at some point it is all going to come hey, on out. I don't think they can keep it together any longer. Right, Mike. That's why they're uh, so, right. uh, this, you know, uh, coming down on the uh, independent media is hard. All right, Mike, can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Well, let's enter Russia in the 1990s when all the journalists were assassinated. And we're not far from that here if they opened up their mouth too much. That's the kind of crap that can happen here. And I just don't – I disagree. People are too scared. It's too interconnected with the media. All this crap about Russia is code for mafia. I just – I disagree, and thank you for taking my call. All right. Well, thank you very much for the call, Rick. We're going to let you go, and obviously I disagree with you about this, or I wouldn't be doing the straight or show or the website. I'd just sit back and say it's hopeless and give me another beer. Uh, but I'm of a different opinion. Uh, and again, my model is the Soviet Union, because everybody inside that Kremlin was working as hard as they could to, to keep certain things hidden from the people. But eventually it started getting out through the Samizdat, and... The Soviet government imploded, and I really think we're on the verge of that happening here to the federal government. And I'm not the only one who says so. Ron Paul is saying that as well. All right, we're getting close to the end of the show here, so, of course, it's time to talk about human-caused global warming. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we're looking uh, – BBC is now reporting on uh, how the uh, U.S. storm uh, uh, is leaving the bomb cyclone. And it was amazing to see that from space. But apparently this intense cold wave is being drawn in after it. So the snowstorm has come and gone, but the temperatures are still dropping. And it is intensely cold there. Uh, parts of the U.S. and Canada, temperatures are expected to fall below minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. This is from the National Weather Service. In Canada, high winds have knocked out power for tens of thousands of, uh, thousands of residents in Nova Scotia. This was a bad, win, a bad one. 
Daily Beast is reporting that New York and Boston may see coldest temperatures on records, uh, as cold as negative 15 degrees from Philadelphia to Boston. And as I said before, I've got family over there. They're sending me photos, uh, and they're all basically just hunkered on in. One of my relatives, uh, because they have a, a fragile elderly person uh, uh, living with them, has already said if the power goes out, and power's going out in a lot of places over there, they're just going to go to a hotel. Now, over in Chicago, uh, they have had 11 days of daytime high temperatures below 20 degrees. The last time they had that, many cold days in a row, was 1936. Before that, the last time they had that many cold days in a row was 1895. Now, obviously, a lot of people are looking at this and saying so much for human-caused global warming. And the carbon Nazis are trying to fight back. They've uh, resurrected uh, this idea they were floating a few years ago when we were in the middle of another record-setting winter, saying that global warming causes cold weather. This is a complete reversal from what they were saying back in 2000, that global warming meant there would be no more snow or ice. But they're out there trying to salvage their reputations by saying bitter cold is exactly what we should expect from the climate crisis. That's their new term. It was human-caused global warming. Then when it was obviously not warming, they said climate change. And then when somebody pointed out climate changes all the time anyway, it was redefined a climate crisis. There's a climate crisis, and you are all to blame. Now, over in Boston, they've had a very rough time. Uh, they had a 15-foot flood of ice water because of the storm surge under that cyclone. Uh, was rec record low air pressure, and of course that draws up the water. It comes on in. People were trapped in cars and homes, and the water froze. It hasn't flowed back to the ocean. There are cars trapped in three feet of solid ice. And given how ice expands as it freezes, I'm not holding up much hope that those cars are going to be drivable uh, following the thaw. <clears throat> now then, uh, apparently, uh, again in Boston, 20,000 are without power there. And a big problem was the winds. Uh, one of my relatives were saying they were getting gusts to hurricane force. Uh, right now, overall, uh, gusts exceeding 30 miles per hour. And it's blowing snow and ice with it, so it's pretty severe. Now, Dellingpole is out there saying that the frozen U.S. is paying a terrible price for the green lies. And he's pointing out how, because of all this talk about human-caused global warming, snowfall thing of the past, please shut down your coal-fired power plants. Uh, these states hit by the storm were not prepared. They didn't have enough snow plows. They didn't have enough road grit. And because of the closure of the coal-fired power plants, they weren't able to meet the surge in demand from people trying to keep their homes and businesses heated. And I was saying exactly the same thing before. As these governments believe this global warming, they cut the budget for winter preparations. Then they get a hard winter, and it is a major problem. Apparently down in Florida, following that cold snap, frozen iguanas are dropping out of the trees. Remember we reported how uh, sharks are freezing solid off the coast of Massachusetts and washing ashore. Down in Florida, it's iguanas. They're freezing to death in the trees and falling out of the trees here. More tragic, over in Akron, Ohio, a 64-year-old man was found frozen to death by a mobile meals worker. Uh, apparently, Mobile Meals was delivering food in the area, and uh, uh, apparently this worker spotted him next to his wheelchair on his enclosed porch. There was an interesting article. This came out of uh, uh, drcircus.com, talking about how all the carbon Nazis are, are begging for, for real global warming. Because it's obvious the world is entering a cooling phase. And they're trying to figure out how they can keep the scam going, 
or at least how they can get out of it without having their reputations as scientists or media personalities or politicians shredded in the process. But it's time to realize, yes, this was a scam. Take something that's happening normally, declared an emergency, and offer to sell everybody a solution, the Hegelian dialectic. And back in the late 1990s, when Al Gore started all of this big scare, it actually was getting warmer. And then nature reversed, and that's when they went into all this hide the decline and the phony charts and the phony data and the rigged computer programs to keep convincing everybody the world was warming and they had to buy and sell carbon credits and pay carbon taxes. But it is probably history's biggest snow job, as the snow in Florida is going to illustrate. And... Right now, almost the entire continental United States is frozen over, snow in record amounts, ice forming in the Great Lakes. They need to use ice breakers off the coast of Massachusetts. And so at, at this point, I presume that most Americans are realizing it was a con job. And it was a conspiracy because of all the people who got together and said, let's convince everybody the world is warming, that carbon dioxide and humans are to blame, and we'll make lots of money, we'll sell lots of books and TV shows. And that's what happened. And it involved Al Gore. It involved the Hadley Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. It involved Penn State. It involved NASA. It involved NOAA. New Zealand's Weather Service, Australia's Weather Service, everybody got sucked into this thing. And they are all guilty of massive fraud against the people of the world. All right, let's take a phone call. Carl in Arizona, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? We lost him. We lost Carl in Arizona. Okay, um, well, fine. Um, let me leave a message for my control room guy here. Now, as you know, Claire and I dealt with this very, very nasty flu. <clears throat> I'm all but over it except for uh, stuff in my throat. Uh, Claire is, as I said before, she's much better. She's not over it. She's much better. Uh, and I am greatly relieved. And, again, thank you to everybody who sent in cards and well wishes uh, but the flu is apparently, it's hit hard and fast. More when we come back from these commercials. Hello, hi, America. Welcome back to the show. And we're talking about the current flu outbreak, and this is a nasty one. And uh, apparently 36 states are reporting very high levels of this flu outbreak, according to the CDC. And this flu is hospitalizing people. Uh, and apparently uh, just in Oregon, 120 people have been sent to the hospital by this bug. Uh, and so it is a very nasty one. Over in Great Britain, their National Health Service has basically pushed off all non-emergency medical procedures until February because their hospitals are jam-packed with people uh, who are dealing with this. And <clears throat> it's rather amazing. Remember back in 2009, there was the big flu pandemic scare and they were talking, the, the when pigs fly flu, it's going to be horrible, it's going to be terrible, buy Tamiflu, and Roche Pharmaceuticals made a bunch of money. But in the end, that flu turned out to be milder than the normal seasonal flu. This one is really nasty. Nobody had a warning for it. The only thing we're hearing from the medical industrial complex uh, is this hemming and hawing, trying to explain why this year's flu shot uh, doesn't seem to have any effect on this. And I would be curious to find out if the people who are being hospitalized did get the flu shot because there was this article that came out, I think it was about three weeks ago, saying that uh, 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 flu shots had been stopped in one country because of the realization that the shot wouldn't stop the illness, but it would make it actually worse if the person contracted it. So there would be uh, grounds for an inquiry there as well. It's not going to happen, of course. But <clears throat> it's a nasty one. And if you are starting to feel sick, uh, see your doctor. Uh, don't, tr don't be brave. Don't go to work. Don't spread this thing around. And uh, Claire and I think we picked this up at her church from all the sneezing, wheezing people there. 
Uh, another update on the Intel chip story. Apparently, it's now known that flaws have been on those chips, most Intel chips, since 1995. Boy, that's why we need to bring back product liability, so that if companies sell bad products, they can be sued. Now, France is going after companies that deliberately shorten the life of hardware. Planned obsolescence is not a viable model in the current economic condition. Now, apparently Oregon, <clears throat> pardon me, is suing Monsanto, alleging that the company withheld information about the toxic effects of its PCB products for decades, leading to widespread contamination across the state and health risks for humans, plants, and animals. Well, gee whiz, another corporation selling a bad, dangerous product and hushing it all up. And finally, this is going to be of interest to photographers and uh, astronomers. Apparently, a new type of lens has been developed uh, that completely avoids chromatic aberration. It's called a meta lens. If I had more time, I'd tell you about how it works. There's the music. Time for me to get on out of here. Uh, have a really good weekend. Please stay tuned for John Stebmiller's program. He's got lots of interesting information to share with you. Please take what you learn here and share it with everyone. Again, please take the article on how to have honest elections and send it to everybody that you know. Start building public awareness. There is a better way. We'll be back on Monday. Aloha, America. <laughs>